Greetings. This session is about four different approaches to planning, which are relevant to the problems of expanding secondary schooling in Africa and in South Asia. Let me start then by introducing four different ways of thinking about the problem. And the problem, of course, is how to decide how many schools, how many school places to, to provide, where to provide them, and what should happen within them. The four approaches that I'm going to introduce you to can be characterized as being driven by social demand, rates of return, projections of the labor force, and lastly, a kind of indicative planning which is very familiar in highly centralized states. So let's take each of those in turn and see what they consist of and see what some of the problems might be with them. So first of all, let's talk about social demand planning. Social demand planning is the simple idea that you should give people what they want. What this means is that once you decide the characteristics of demand for different levels of schooling, then you should endeavour to provide the number of school places in the case of compulsory education, number of school places that match the number of children. Of course, in secondary schooling, when it becomes selective and all children don't participate, the choices are rather different. You cannot simply provide places for all children above the compulsory age of school attendance, and perhaps you shouldn't, because, of course, children make choices and have very different aspirations and expectations, as do their parents. Social demand planning then, in practice, boils down to trying to work out the qualified lever rate, the opportunity and willingness rate, and doing a simple calculation to work out how many school places of different kinds you wish to provide. You'll see on the slide then a way of describing this which is fairly familiar to anybody who works in higher education. The idea that you work out how many A-level graduates, post-secondary school graduates there are, how many of them are qualified to go to university or technical college, how many of those who are qualified are in a position to attend, and how many of those who are in a position to attend actually want to attend. So this kind of reasoning can be applied to upper secondary schooling if it's beyond the compulsory cycle, and indeed the lower secondary schooling uh, if it's not universal. There are some problems, of course, with this kind of planning. The first is how to choose between alternatives if all of them are not affordable. If the characteristics of demand generate requests or applications to attend different kinds of institutions uh, and the national budget isn't sufficient to accommodate all these wants, a decision has to be made and to provide for some and not for others. Social demand can be very unstable. Uh, it's familiar in OECD countries that where unemployment, when unemployment is high and the opportunity costs of attending higher and further education low, uh, then many more people stay in school and further education. When the opposite is true, though, you can see a rapid change in patterns of demand. Thirdly, it's a problem for social demand that what people want may not be what they need. It's perfectly feasible to imagine that different sections of the community want different things for their girls and for their boys, and their girls and boys want different things from their parents. What may be individually rational may not be collectively rational. And this, of course, also applies to marginal groups. So that's some of the key aspects of social demand planning. Should you provide secondary school places for everybody who wants to go to secondary school? Should you provide secondary school places in TVET for everybody who wants to do TVET, even if it's very expensive? Should you decide from some sort of national planning point of view how many places you can afford and make decisions on the basis of a strategic plan? The second approach to planning, which is widely used and which can guide decisions on how much provision to finance, is rates of return. Rates of return is a very simple idea. It's the idea that you get benefit from attending school or college or university 
and that this enhances your prospects of subsequent earnings in the labour market. If you compare the cost of acquiring the schooling with the additional earnings that you enjoy as a result of having that higher level of qualification, then a simple equation can work out the rate of return which justifies the level of investment that you have made whilst you have been paying for education. The idea is very simple. The execution of it can be quite complex because working out things like lifetime earnings in emerging economies which change rapidly is of course a very uncertain affair. But nevertheless, some of the signals which come from rates of return can be useful. Private rates of return, remember, are about the benefits to the individual, after tax income and so on. Social rates of return are about the benefits to the society in terms of additional earnings and growth and so on. What are the problems with rates of return? Well. I've already mentioned one of them, like working out lifetime earnings is a difficult thing to do and we'll have many uncertainties, particularly where in a rapidly developing country the structure of labour market changes. Of course labour markets may also be very imperfect and some people may be paid far more than in productivity terms they're actually worth. So we could get misleading signals from some types of educational qualification which have a premium value more than indeed their contribution to productivity. It's also true for some people that they may not be motivated by the idea of investing in education in order to get a benefit of a financial kind which would throw some of our calculations out. And perhaps lastly uh, there is a big difficulty about using the number of years of schooling as a proxy for what individuals have learned and assuming that additional years of schooling incrementally increase productivity and earnings. Of course this may not be true and it may be that it matters more which school you went to than the number of years you attended. This would also throw out some of the rates of return type ways of looking at planning. Thirdly, let us move on to a different approach to the subject and this is best described perhaps as using labour market projections to determine demand for different levels of qualification and different categories of, of skill and types of employment. Again it's a very simple idea that somehow we can identify future demand for different types of workers, for the kinds of skills and knowledge that they need and that we can associate these in some way with managing the inputs and outputs to the education system. If we were to do this then we would try and look at the labour market in terms of its existing structure and projections about its future structure in terms of how many graduates are employed and how many will be employed, how many secondary school leavers at different levels, how many people in different, with different levels of skill from technical colleges or from nursing colleges or whatever else um, we differentiate our further education and training by. We could also look by sector and look within agriculture, within industry, within the service sector to see which of these is likely to provide the most employment in the future and at what level that employment is likely to be in terms of knowledge and skill. If we can perform the trick of putting all that together into a calculation then we get some idea of where we're likely to have shortfalls in qualified and educated people coming out of the secondary school system and indeed the higher education system. What are the problems with this approach? Well, rather like social demand, there are problems of, of course, gazing into the future and projecting what will happen. We don't actually know. But then, nevertheless, systematic projections are better than just guessing. The way this is often done is to ask employers about their intentions for the future. And there's a risk often that employers exaggerate the number of people they will employ and the level of qualification that they require. Notwithstanding that, future labour markets may be very different to current labour markets in terms of the proportion of people who work in agriculture or in the um, service sector or in manufacturing. And whatever we as educationists may think, employers may regard many people in the labour market as substitutable in terms of levels of educational qualification.
they may care more about how people do jobs than whether they're formally qualified to do them. And lastly, flexible specialisation, the kind of labour markets which increasingly derive benefit from generic skill and change rapidly, are of course a problem if we're trying to do projections which assume that we can put people into boxes of qualification and skill, when in practice these have very permeable boundaries. The last approach I want to introduce you to is indicative planning. This is characteristic of countries which have strong centralised states, five-year plans, and believe that the future can be created on the supply side. What this may mean in practice is that an ambition to industrialise is preceded by trying to work out what kind of knowledge and skill in the labour force we would need in order to industrialise. We would then start educating and training people to reflect that and hope that as a result industrialisation would happen. This sounds as if it requires a great deal of prescience about the future, and it does. Clearly, one can be very wrong. But nevertheless, it is what some governments and some development plans do. They anticipate the development of a tourist industry and start planning and educating tourist guides in advance of the tourists showing up. This might work because it will make it more attractive to tourists to show up. But of course, equally, other factors may intervene to make that a risky bet. So in general, indicative planning does assume that inputs will lead to outputs, which may not necessarily be true. The timescale over which things may happen uh, may be variable and quite unpredictable. And there are issues of quality as well as quantity. The approach does assume that it's somehow possible to pick winners, to pick sectors of the economy that are going to grow and that there won't be oversupply of people with particular types of knowledge and skill. So there are obvious risks involved. So I've introduced you to four different approaches to planning, which are generic. They are the kinds of things that have to be considered when thinking about the expansion of secondary schooling above the level of compulsory education. And they're certainly the kind of things that apply to further and higher education where choices have to be made in terms of national strategy about what to support uh, and what to discourage. The four planning models then, in summary, are social demand, which is providing students with what they say they want, but not necessarily what the government thinks they need. Second approach is to look at market signals from the labour market and see what kind of rates of return students achieve in terms of the cost of the education and training and the additional income that they then generate, assuming that this reflects their productivity. The third approach is to look at labour force planning and to project into the future demands for different categories of qualification and knowledge and skill in different sectors and try and respond to that and anticipate it. And finally, indicative planning creates a planning model in which a vision of the future drives provision in the present on the assumption that supply will indeed generate the outcomes which are anticipated in the future. Those four models provide a backdrop then for discussions of how to plan the future beyond the compulsory education cycle. Any kind of strategic planning is going to have several characteristics. It requires a consistent, predictable and balanced pattern of investment that leads forward into the future. It involves realising that whatever is done in terms of expansion, the scaling up of service provision is likely to have many non-linear characteristics. It won't be a straight line from the present to the future in terms of the expansion in the number of schools, the number of teachers, uh, the number of students enrolled and so on. There may well be many leads and lags and non-linearities in how that growth takes place. Understanding that on the basis of the historic record can be a very valuable basis to planning the future. Thirdly, three-year plans really aren't long enough to anticipate forward liabilities and to ensure that whatever growth takes place is sustainable. A longer projection framework is needed. 
laissez-faire and muddling through approaches, which are characteristic of some systems, particularly those where governments are fragile and unstable, are unlikely to create durable outcomes where expanded secondary schooling is sustainable. They're very unlikely to create systems which are equitable and which offer opportunity to the poorest parts of the society. We should remember that building quality is cumulative and it can be undermined by over rapid expansion and by expansion which isn't planned to protect quality. Supply constraints also may be replaced by demand constraints as more and more children are enrolled at older ages. Adolescents have agency in a way that young children don't. The demand side becomes very important in terms of whether expanded provision attracts and retains motivated learners. And lastly, we have to remember that the resourcing aspects of expanded secondary schooling are critical to the whole enterprise. The costs of secondary schooling are often too high to support mass access to secondary schools. The models on which they're based may derive from a past where secondary schooling was a highly selective enterprise with assumptions about the curriculum, the time on task, the specialised facilities and so on, which were necessary to educate children at secondary level. Because structures have to be looked at alongside plans for expansion to establish whether or not what is proposed is indeed plausible in all but the short term. With those remarks then I leave you with the questions that are raised by the different planning models for an approach to expanding secondary schooling. Thank you very much.